wonderful. I am so honored to introduce our first guest tonight, Varshini Prakash, Executive Director of the Sunrise Movement. Varshini, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to just get right into it and start with the question. So Varshini, how did you participate in the recent climate strike? And can you share a story from that experience that stood out for you? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, it is wonderful to be spending my Sunday night with you all. Thank you so much for having me to the Working Families fam. Um, and yes, again, my name is Varshini and I'm one of the co-founders and executive director of Sunrise Movement. Um, I am based in Boston, but I was able to spend my climate strike day on Friday, September 20th in New York City alongside, I think, 250,000 other young people. It was incredible that on that day, there were 7.6 million young people worldwide that striked. Um, in over 6,000 strike events. I believe there were just over half a million in the United States alone um, with, with 1,300 strike events just here in America. Um, and we pulled off the biggest day of climate action in world history. So if you were a part of that, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for bringing your kids or participating yourselves. Um, and it was incredible to see on Friday for a few hours, our generation truly took over the world. Our voices, our anger, our energy, our demands for serious action were everywhere. We flooded the streets on all seven continents and we were on the front page of basically every single major newspaper in the world. Um, one of the stories that stood out for me in particularly was this one from Houston. And um, Houston, which has been experiencing the effects of, of a warming world for years now, uh, was actually in the midst of a tropical storm, Esmelda, on the day of the climate strike. And in pouring rain with the streets of some of the organizers of the climate strikes just drowned in water, we saw 1,200 people come out and participate in the climate strikes. It was organized by a coalition of young people in the city. Um, and the, the stories you heard from people who were uh, recovering from hurricanes in the past and, and were refusing to, to and, and were taking action in the face of climate calamity in that moment were just astonishing. Um, in Boston, which is my hometown, there were 10,000 people who uh, came out for the climate strike and it was organized primarily by a leadership of team of people under 20. And of course we saw incredible actions in a lot of the major cities, but to see the images coming out of uh, South Bend, Indiana and Des Moines, Iowa was just so heartening to me to see how this is um, having influence across the nation. And when I think about how I describe the day, it was one of the most beautiful, invigorating moments of my life to see all of these young people and at the same time, just like astonishingly heartbreaking. And there were like many times that I, I was holding back or, or tears or just crying in the middle of that, seeing these children who were five, six, seven years, who were in grade school, um, knowing that in many ways, the timeline of this crisis is so short that by the time they are even of voting age, their futures might be uh, compromised and, and we might have a full blown emergency and crisis on our hands. Um, so that's, that's the way that I would describe it. Wow. Thank you so much for describing that with such vivid emotions and language. I felt like I was there. Uh, I have a few more questions for you, if you don't mind, Varshini. Yeah. Um, so if you could talk a little bit more about the climate strike. So what you described sounds amazing. The fact that it was, you know, I noticed it. People all, the, all around the world noticed it. Um, like you said before, it was on the front cover of every newspaper. So what's next? Mm -hmm. Can you give some detail on where this movement is going in the next year or two? Yeah, totally. So, you know, what we did on that Friday was incredible. And at the same time, I think many of us left feeling like even though there were 600,000 of us who joined the strikes in the U.S., there were not enough of us yet. As big as we were, it is only a fraction of what we actually need. So over the next few months and years, we need to be growing our power not just this fall, not just for next spring, not even just for November 2020, but also for what's gonna happen next. In 2021, no matter who wins the presidency, 
if we want to defend our very right to survive, because this is what this is about, we are going to need tens of millions of Americans to join us in the streets. So what does that mean for our strategy over the next few years? Step one, we are looking ahead to a massive strike on April 22nd, 2020. This is Earth Day. And it's special because it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And it also happens to be my birthday. Um, so we think Earth Day has recently gotten a little bit too tame. I know I grew up just like hearing about the corporate greenwashing it. But if you look back in history, the first Earth Day mobilized 20 million Americans in 1970. 20 million Americans. That level of heightened social mobilization led to the passing of massive environmental policy like the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, uh, the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, um, things that we still use today and are, are, are critical to protecting Americans' clean air and clean water. So we think there's a huge opportunity to strike on Earth Day in 2020, but not just marches in the streets. We need sit-ins, we need holdouts at politicians' offices. We need strikes that last multiple days or even a week. So that's, that's the next step. Step two, we know that winning a Green New Deal, as Maurice has mentioned, and as you all know, as part of uh, Working Families Party, it's gonna take political power as well. So after a massive Earth Day strike, we'll organize our generation uh, to go all in for the most important generations of uh, elections our generation has ever faced. Um, and we'll team up intergenerationally as well. So by going all in for the 2020 election, we can defeat the forces of fascism and elect a government with a mandate to enact what we think of as the decade of the Green New Deal. And we'll need to get behind more people, uh, those like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, and make clear that if candidates want the youth vote, they need to show us that they are ready to stand up to the oil and gas lobby and make the Green New Deal a day one priority. And then we have step three. To win the Green New Deal after 2020, we are gonna to need to put incredible pressure on elected officials to make it a reality. Our best tool to do this is gonna be mass non-cooperation co through strikes and prolonged demonstrations. We don't know exactly what this will include. It could be a strike for one day or many, it could be sitting in public places or occupying offices. What we do know is this will have to be one of the largest youth demonstrations in American history. And structural changes, the kind that take money and power away from the richest in society um, and transfer it to the many, only can happen when a critical mass of the public is refusing to comply with the rules and rituals that define daily life and make our society function. So it's not just enough for us to turn tens of millions of people out in one city for an hour or two. Um, we can't just repeat the strikes that happened a couple of weeks ago, but bigger and assume we'll get the level of change in action we need. We need something like 10 million people across hundreds of cities across the country to walk out of work or school, um, to apply a level of pressure we haven't seen to make sure that even sympathetic politicians uh, will ultimately buckle to the pressure applied um, from the other side by billionaires and CEOs. So we'll need greater scale. We need greater escalation. Um, the ability to move key sectors of American society to shut down business as usual for a prolonged period of time. Um, and we need some really clear core demands. It was really easy for politicians like Dianne Feinstein and others who haven't supported the Green New Deal, but are deep, were deeply uh, in support of the strikes, um, largely because there haven't been specific demands that actually make politicians a little bit uncomfortable and force them to grapple with the reality of what this crisis is demanding of us. We need to double down in that way. Um, and ultimately, this is about moving larger and strategic parts of society into a state of mass non-cooperation. Wow. Thank you, Varshini. Um, I know I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure Everybody else on the on the line and, and those who can't make it that are part of the WFP family are totally in and committed to doing everything we could do um, for us, but also for the amazing young people around the globe and the young people that you work with every day. Um, you know, um, I think you're, you're, you're truly inspiring those of us that no longer uh, no have aged out of that category. <laughs> but um, I've, I've been sort of felt a renewed vigor because of the work that you do. So I have one, one last question. And we ask this to everybody that we bring on as a guest. 
uh, to the Working Families Party Assembly. Will you join us as a Working Families Party member today? Yes. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I can't believe I haven't done this yet, but yes, <laughs> absolutely. Right on. Well, thanks for joining as a member, for officially becoming a member of the Working Families Party, and I'll return the favor and uh, figure out how I could, uh, even as no longer a youth, become uh, some sort of official member of the Sunrise Movement. <laughs>